Welcome to my ad educational webinar series sponsored by Highmark. I would like to thank each of you for joining the series and would like to ask each of you to add your name and location to the chat box, which is located at the top of your computer screen. Our guest speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Anderson, will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So please remember to place them in the chat box. Today, Dr. Anderson will be speaking on the latest trends in rehabilitation. I would like to go ahead and um, thank our sponsor for this webinar series, Highmark. Highmark makes it possible for us to share this information with you all. And Dr. Anderson has graciously accepted our invitation to present to all of our survivors, caregivers, and constituents with Bayat. So I want to thank him for that. And before I introduce our speaker, I would like to just have a little um, housekeeping items. The webinar will be a recorded session and we will continue to share the important information with our community. I will be posting the 2023 webinar series on the website tomorrow and this record this webinar will be recorded. Again, please make sure that you put your questions in the chat box, which is located at the top of your computer screen. And I would like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Jeffrey Anderson. Dr. Jeffrey Anderson is a um, physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist who has practiced in um, Salisbury. Is that Salisbury? Salisbury. Salisbury, oh, I had it right. Salisbury, Maryland since 1994. Dr. Anderson is licensed in the states of Maryland and Delaware, and he is board certified by the American Board of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Dr. Anderson, did you want to go ahead and share it with our um, guests? Yeah, sure. I'm ready. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so as a uh, as you heard, I am a uh, rehabilitation doctor or what's called a physiatrist. I uh, was in private practice in Salisbury, Maryland on the Eastern shore for about 28 years. And I was in a variety of settings there. I did consulting work at an acute care hospital and I was on staff at a uh, acute rehab hospital that was um, it's presently about 74 beds. I think when we started, we were about 34, 35 beds. Um, I saw a variety of outpatients, including brain injury. I was the program director for the stroke program there, as well as the spasticity program. Uh, I do EMG nerve conduction studies and uh, went to a variety of nursing homes. So I did a lot of things there. And um, most recently, however, I have come to work for post-acute medical in Delaware, um, and I am enjoying the, enjoying the transition uh, thus far. Uh, you could go to the next slide for me. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with post-acute medical, um, it is a nationally privately owned um, company, healthcare company. And right now we have um, three hospitals in Delaware, which are in this slide here. We have one in, up in Dover, which was the first one. And that is a 34 bed hospital, uh, freestanding rehab hospital in Dover. And um, just opened a, uh, a hospital in Georgetown in January. And that is also about 34 beds. And then presently I'm based at the Milford Hospital in um, that is uh, part of the Bay Health Sussex campus. And we're in the process there of building a freestanding rehab hospital on the campus uh, separate from the main hospital. So right now I'm actually talking to you from Milford from that building there. All right, next slide. So I wanted to, um, to just review a few basics about uh, traumatic brain injury. Probably a lot of you have heard these statistics before, but I think they they bear repeating just to give you some idea of the scope of traumatic brain injury, particularly in the, in the United States. So uh, TBI uh, contributes to about 30% of all injury deaths. As, uh, as you well know, it's a leading cause of disability in the US. Um, the CDC estimates that there's approximately 
5.3 million people right now in the United States living with um, a traumatic brain injury related disability. So it's, it's quite prevalent. Um, in 2019, there was uh, 2.87 million TBI related emergency department uh, visits that accounted for 50% uh, uh, or 57% of those uh, of that 2.87 million uh, were in the emergency room alone. Of those, 22% were hospitalized, and of that total, 21% uh, ended up dying from their injuries. Um, the incidence is highest in, in children um, ages 0 to 4, and then in adults over the age of 75. Uh, leading causes um, continue to be falls, uh, motor vehicle accidents, and, and blows to the head. So. Um, falls, uh, you know, is still number one. And that's why we see the, uh, the high, higher percentage in young children and older adults. And then blows to the head would also include things like sports injuries. So either being struck by something or running into something. In 2019, the average hospital stay uh, for a traumatic brain injury was about $35,000. And in 2013, estimated total costs are about $11.5 billion. So uh, involves a lot of people. It's a very expensive um, illness. There's a, an organization known as the Model Systems Knowledge Translation Center, and they, they study uh, several different things, including traumatic brain injuries and um, spinal cord injuries. And um, they looked at what are considered moderate to severe traumatic brain injuries. So those are uh, brain injuries that are based on um, someone's uh, Glasgow coma score, what they look like when they first came in. And they, they uh, in their studies, they found that 50% of those people who are admitted with moderate to severe TBIs have a, um, have a good recovery or what would be considered by the, the patient themselves as a good recovery. 25%, however, continue to have a moderate disability and 25% have end up having a severe disability. So quite a few of those patients in that um, category of moderate to severe end up going on to have either a moderate or to severe disability. Next slide. So just a little bit about um, the uh, history of TBI. I'm a big fan of history and I always think it's it's kind of neat to look back on you know what we've known and how long have we known it. And some of the earliest uh, writings about traumatic brain injury date back to ancient Egypt and they actually have some papyrus writings that talk about the treatment of brain injury at the time and that treatment included such things as bandaging the wound with things like meat and honey and an oil dressing. And then there's, there's some reports uh, from um, early writings about King Henry VIII. And we all know he was a little wacky. He had uh, at least one of his wives, if not more, uh, killed for various reasons um, or assassinated. Uh, but some of his erratic behavior, they believe, was actually due to uh, repetitive uh, brain injury. He apparently was a... Um, was prone to fits of rage later in life and uh, his behavior was very erratic. And we know that he enjoyed some dangerous sports like pole vaulting and jousting and things like that. And uh, there is very clear documentation that he had uh, fairly several severe um, injuries to the head. And so there are those historians and scholars who feel that um, some of his behavior may be related to repeated uh, injuries to the brain. And then uh, a, a fairly well-known case is um, the case of Phineas Gage. And I want to go to the next slide. I'll show you a picture of Phineas Gage. Um, Phineas Gage, for those of you who aren't familiar with this story, he was uh, a um, foreman on a railroad construction team. And in 1846, he was um, working with some dynamite when a large rod uh, went um, up from the ground, passed through his skull behind his left eye there and exited the top of his skull. And it was very unusual 
situation because um, he, he went on to survive this injury and lived for another 12 years. So a lot of, um, there was a lot written about him at the time in medical literature. He's very well studied and it's, it's unique case because he, he clearly had um, what was a frontal lobe injury, as you can see uh, in that illustration, uh, the rod went directly through his frontal lobe and he lived in, he lived a fairly functional life after that, but um, it's well described in the medical literature and the uh, psychological literature or psychiatry literature of, of the time that um, he had a very different personality and they described what we now know as a, uh, a frontal lobe um, injury. So he is, his personality was different. He had a very flat affect and those friends of his uh, who knew him well prior to the injury just described him as not no longer being Gage. In other words, he was a very different person after his injury. So this, this taught the, um, the medical personnel of that time a very valuable lesson that, in fact, um, some people can survive such a traumatic brain injury. Uh, most at that time died either of infection or just from, from secondary causes. Um, so it, it gave some hope to those um, with, uh, with brain injury. And as you know, during the, um, during the uh, uh, Civil War, uh, a lot of people had brain injury because of um, gunshot wounds to the head. And that's when uh, the use of a trephin or, or almost like a screw type instrument was used to relieve pressure to the brain. And then um, we'll go back, back a slide. Um, yeah, so that um, as time has gone on and technology has advanced, there's been a traumatic number of um, a dramatic number of increase in traumatic brain injuries in the past uh, 100 years or so. And, and that is multifactorial. Uh, for one thing, there was the advent of the invention of the automobile. And that has played a very uh, significant role in the increased number of brain injuries. And then also um, medical technology and, um, and advancement has is a large reason why that more people are surviving with brain injury today than they did even 100 years ago. Okay, we can slip, skip forward probably two slides now. There you go. So I wanted to give a um, just a, an overview on some areas of uh, advancement in uh, traumatic brain injury rehabilitation. Some things that we are um, actively seeing now and some things that are in the uh, research stages. Um, so I picked four areas that I wanted to talk about. Uh, one is just the, uh, the team approach, um, how we approach uh, the patient as a medical team. The second involves the use of medications that are given to patients right now and um, some research that's ongoing. Uh, the third is uh, is technology, how that's being used in rehab, and then the advent of telemedicine we'll talk a little bit about at the end. Next slide. So the multidisciplinary team approach is something that I have really seen evolve in my 30 years as a clinician. Um, when I first started, uh, there was that concept of having a, a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary team approach. Uh, but I've definitely seen it grow over the years, and there are more people involved in the team approach. And obviously, the the patient and the family are kind of the center, or the core of the team. Um, the physiatrist is is in the rehab model the physician leader of that team, um, but it may also include internists or neurologists, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, depending on additional injuries that the patient may have. Obviously, nursing is a uh, is a key member of that team. Um, there are some nurses who now have uh, certification in, in re as a rehabilitation nurse that's offered. Um, also, we see uh, clinical social workers or case managers, of course, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech and language pathologists. Uh, next slide. Um, recreation therapists, uh, psychologists or neuropsychologists, uh, respiratory therapists, dietitians, orthotists, prosthetists, um, vocational therapists, and of course, uh, chaplains are involved uh, in some settings. 
as well. So there's there's many more involved. This next slide, um, you can go to the next slide there. That, that shows, um, I like this slide because it shows that the patient and the family as being sort of the center of the team. When I talk to a, a patient who first arrives in the rehab setting, I like to use the analogy that they are the quarterback of this team. They're an important member of this team and their feedback is very important because we're all here for them and for them only. Um, but the, the the team members, you know, can involve many other um, uh, folks, as, as I already mentioned. And there's some additional ones on here, such as rehabilitation engineers who may work on augmentative communication devices and things like that, even um, at a larger scale, home health agency, vocational counselors. Uh, for, for those who are still school age, there may be school counselors or teachers, principals involved. Uh, for those who are working, employers, uh, vocational counselors. So there are many members to that team. And next slide will show us some, you know, some of the advantages to that multidisciplinary approach is that um, there's an improved coordination of care. Um, and I, I think that's, uh, that's something that's um, really obvious when you work on a rehabilitation unit, you realize um, how uh, important that coordinated care is and the ongoing communication formally and informally between team members. So we will, in a setting like I'm in right now in an acute care hospital, acute rehab hospital, we'll sit down at least on a weekly basis and have a formal team conference. Um, but we also discuss the patient informally on pretty much a daily basis. And it's great having access to these other team members uh, because we can um, address issues immediately as they occur. So there's, you know, better communication for sure. Uh, there's a better consistency of care across the board. And that in turn results in improved outcomes and shorter length of stays and hopefully improved uh, patient and family satisfaction. Next slide. So this slide is a, is a little busy, but I wanted to talk um, briefly about the use of medication specifically in the um, brain injury population. And again, um, in my 30 years of practice, I have really seen uh, the use of medications grow in, um, in the, re in the uh, TBI rehab population. When I first started, um, we were beginning to use uh, drugs like Ritalin or methylphenidate to improve arousal. Uh, and things like that, but really specific drugs um, for um, certain aspects of that are unique to a traumatic brain injury um, are being used more and more on a regular basis. So I want to, this slide represents some of the drugs now that are frequently used um, in these patients. And you can see that the slide breaks it down uh, to the acute phase. So less than a month after the injury, and then the chronic phase uh, over a month after the brain injury. And then atop, across the top are um, sort of the classifications of when these drugs are used. So for neuropsychological sequelae, for uh, neurocognitive sequelae, behavioral sequelae, and um, for, for those patients who may have a decreased level of consciousness. And I, I won't go through um, the medications in great detail, Detail, but just to touch on a few, uh, because a few of these medications, I'm, sort, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with. So um, for the neuropsychiatric sequelae, such as, as uh, depression after a, a brain injury, that's very common. Um, we see more use of antidepressants, and, and in particular, the um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors are, are commonly used. Uh, and tend to be, for the most part, pretty well tolerated in a TBI patient, uh, both in the acute phase and in the, the chronic phase or post-acute phase. So those um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, an example of one of those would be Prozac, which is probably one of the better known. Um, and then in the chronic phase, we're also using, uh, at times, valproic acid. Um, and then for the neurocognitive sequelae, um, medications like methylphenidate or Ritalin uh, are being used um, to improve attention, uh, memory, processing speed, things like that. 
and then amantadine, which is a drug that's been around for quite a while that's used for um, Parkinson's disease. We're also using that for um, attention and concentration in the uh, early phase of recovery. Um, and a newer medication uh, is uh, Aricept, and that is, that's the third one there. The, the generic is denapazil, um, and that's also used for attention and, me and memory deficits. Um, and then also some of those you know, medications are, are used not only in the acute phase, but also the chronic phase, as you can see. Um, and then some other medications um, are used more chronically than acutely just because of the potential uh, sedating effects of some of them. Um, and, and those you can see there. So um, in the neural behavioral sequelae, again, some of those uh, same medications are used such as amantadine. Not only can it be helpful in improving uh, concentration and level of alertness, but also in reducing a patient's anxiety or level of agitation early on. Um, so we, we prefer some of those drugs as opposed to some of the more sedating drugs like, um, like Haldol or, or Xanax. Um, again, also the, uh, the same medications that can help with depression can also help with anxiety, such as the serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And then um, as far as the chronic phase, um, you know, to help with things like aggression and agitation, sometimes we use a beta blocker. And a lot of you are familiar with those because they're used um, in, in cardiac patients for either arrhythmias, sometimes to control blood pressure. So an example of a cardiac medication would be something like propran or a beta blocker would be something like propranolol. Um, so that's some, something that's uh, used as well. And then amitriptyline, um, we use sometimes later for agitation. And uh, another name for that is Elevil. Um, um, bupropion or, or Welbutrin is an antidepressant uh, that is also used uh, sometimes for restlessness um, in, a, in a traumatic brain injury. And then in terms of improving level of consciousness, we mentioned Ritalin already. That was a medication that's been around for a while that we've been using to try to improve the level of arousal uh, for patients in a vegetative state. Um, that are more severe. Sometimes we use a medication called uh, bromocryptine, um, which is uh, in some studies has shown to be uh, particularly helpful. It's also known as Parladel, and that is one of those medications that was traditionally used for Parkinson's patients that we're now using uh, for, for some um, TBI patients in, in the right setting. Um, and then uh, again, in the chronic phase for uh, improving level of consciousness or level of arousal. Um, we're using um, levodopa, uh, carbidopa, or carbidopa, which is the combined drug there is called Cinemet. And again, that may be familiar to some of you uh, because of its use in Parkinson's patients is pretty common. Um, so we're using Cinemet now sometimes for um, patients with uh, chronic um, problems with arousal. And then um, amantadine, I think we met, we mentioned already and amitriptyline also we're using in that chronic phase for level arousal. Next slide, I wanna talk about um, some new medications uh, that are being used um, or at least studied at this point. Um, they are, you know, a lot of them are in the research phase and they are, they fall into a category that I would call neuroprotective agents. So if we, this slide illustrates sort of the different phases of brain injury. So if we think about brain injury, we think of the primary injury of the, the obvious injury to the brain, and that's what occurs first. So that may be a brain contusion or bruising on the brain itself. And that in turn um, may result in vascular injury, uh, actually bleeding into the brain. Uh, and because of that, uh, neural or axonal injury, so damage to the nerve structures of the brain. And then when that happens, um, those damaged structures release their chemicals, and uh, those, those chemicals are called cytokines or chemokines, and that they then result in secondary damage. So that's the, um, the next uh, block that you see down there, secondary injury. So you have the primary injury, 
And then the secondary injury is something that initially has was not well understood, but something that we're starting to understand uh, more about as research progresses. And the secondary injury is a result of that primary injury when we see destruction of nerve cells and, and swelling of those tissues. We see inflammation of the surrounding tissues, um, which causes uh, uh, such things as excitotoxicity and oxidative stress. And take home message for that is those are all bad things that are happening within the surrounding area of the brain, um, surrounding the area of the original or core injury. Um, and demyelination, which is the, the myelin is the uh, covering of the axon or the, like the insulation around the wire, if the axon is the wire, um, and further neurodegeneration. So some of these medications that are coming down the pipeline are specifically geared at trying to minimize the extent of brain injury. So, um, you know, there's not a lot that we can do sometimes about the initial primary injury, except for things like wearing helmets and, and taking precautions to prevent the injury in the first place. But um, once the injury occurs, there may be more that we can do and we're starting to recognize in preventing secondary injury um, to a larger part of the brain. And that's what these, these medications are doing. And then as a result of the primary injury and the secondary injury, that's when we end up having neurological deficits such as um, loss of neurological functions, such as you know, inability to move a limb, um, cognitive decline, psychological alterations, such as decreased level of, of arousal or consciousness, um, depression that we talked about. So next slide, uh, next two slides actually will just give us an example of some of these medications that are in the in the research um, pipeline and. Um, a lot of these medications are being used right now for other reasons. And we have through research and, and um, primarily animal studies, we have found that they are uh, particularly helpful in, in preventing the secondary injury or the extent of at least of the secondary injury. So the first medication um, that I wanted to mention is these glitazones or uh, thiazolid, I can't even say this. Um, you can read it. I can't say it. Um, but uh, those are medications right now. The first two here are medications that are used to treat diabetes and hyperglycemia. The second medication is, is very commonly used, and that is gliburide. Um, and so both of these medications have been shown to have a neuroprotective effect uh, when they're given early on, at least in animal models at this point, and have been found to um, decrease uh, the amount of of hemorrhage in the area and secondary damage that's done from, from a traumatic brain injury. Uh, the next slide, uh, we'll show you a couple more of those drugs. Um, the statin drugs, obviously a lot of people know what those are because a lot of us are on the statins for high cholesterol. So they're a cholesterol um, lowering drug. Uh, but again, uh, they have also been shown to reduce cerebral ischemia or uh, improve blood flow to a particular area, and they've been shown to reduce the extent of hemorrhage. Uh, so there's one clinical study that shows that um, patients who were on a statin versus those who weren't uh, showed uh, significant functional recovery 12 months after injury. And then the, uh, the fourth drug is progesterone. And it, Many of you may have heard, heard of that. That is a, a female hormone. And in some animal um, studies, that's been shown to have a neuroprotective effect um, as well. So this is kind of exciting area. Um, this is not something that if you, um, you know, if you're admitted at this moment, unless it's to a uh, academic center or, or a uh, teaching hospital, you probably won't get any of these drugs. Um, at this point, but um, they are all in research phases at different levels um, and show a lot of promise in terms of preventing some of this secondary injury um, and pretend, potentially uh, preventing a lot of disability down the, uh, down the road. Next slide. So the third area I wanted to talk about was, um, was that of technology. And um, 
uh, technology is is something that is sort of evading our lives in many different ways. Um, I'm sure that uh, you know, as I go through some of this, you'll be able to think of some uses outside of um, medicine and it's particularly TBI rehab where you've seen these things used. Um, one thing we're going to touch on is virtual reality. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of our homes now have virtual reality. If we have kids who uh, play games, video games, uh, that's come a long way. Uh, robotics, um, brain computer interfaces, I think you'll find that interesting. And then also functional electrical stimulation uh, is the fourth area of technology that I wanted to talk about. All right, the next slide will show um, a quote that, I've, that I thought was interesting. Um, this was um, from a journal called Frontiers of Neurology, and it was from 2018. It was talking specifically about the use of virtual reality um, in the treatment of post-TBI patients. So it says, the quote, the close association between post-TBI neurological changes, persistent neuroinflammation, and late neuropathology highlights the fact that the window of opportunity for therapeutic intervention may be much wider than previously thought, and that the long-term treatment encompassing the acute and chronic phase should be tested to effectively interfere with this complex condition. So that's a, uh, it's a long sentence, but I want, I want to highlight one part of that sentence, and that is that they believe that the window of opportunity for therapeutic intervention, in other words, um, when treatment is most effective may be a lot longer than what we thought. Um, I know just in the, in the stroke world and also in the TBI world, when I first started my training, um, sort of the, the mantra was that most of the recovery that you're going to see within either a, a brain injury or a stroke patient will happen within the first month. And after that, um, a lot of patients plateaued and you didn't see much. But I think that mindset is progressively changing. Um, and uh, much to the dismay of insurance companies, because where that, um, how long that, or how large that window is, I think has yet to be seen. So next slide. Some benefits that we are seeing from virtual reality is it, it can provide a neurorestorative instrument or, or an effective treatment that can be readily available at the bedside. In studies with stroke patients, virtual reality programs um, have shown an improvement in recovery of both motor function and activities of daily living. Uh, it can offer a very um, sort of real world um, type of treatment. So in other words, it can, it can replicate things that are being done by a patient every day and very specifically, such as finding objects, assembling things, um, buying uh, items. Um, it can, anything you can think of, pretty much virtual reality can replicate. And the, the technology is just improving on a, on a daily basis. It can be used as an assessment tool to detect um, things such as visual, visual vestibular deficits in an adult after a mild or um, TBI or a concussion. Um, and it can also be used as a therapeutic instrument. Um, there was one study that demonstrated that immersive virtual reality can be used as an effective neuro rehab tool to enhance executive function. So that's higher level functioning, cognitive functioning and information processing in the uh, subacute period. So m long after, uh, months and months after somebody has a brain injury, even years, um, they can still achieve some benefit from this technology. Um, the next slide will be a video that I hope uh, works. Um, we, we tried it out and I think it does. And that'll give you a little bit of a, an idea of what this looks like in, in real time. Is the sound on? No, we can't hear it.
Can you all not hear the sound? No, we can't hear the sound. Okay. All right. Let me try it again. Yeah, we still can't hear it. It is ironic that we're talking about Our research challenge consisted of the development of virtual reality applications to treat veterans with traumatic brain injury. The grill team developed, performed, and tested the VR protocol, which included various interactive instrumental activities of daily living, also known as IADLs. The team was able to test, receive feedback, make modifications, and redeploy applications on site at the AFRL facility located in Dayton, Ohio for rapid prototyping. VA Palo Alto Healthcare System Polytrauma Apartment was recreated virtually as the target environment. Developers designed tasks that included problems in executive function, motor control, and organization of activities of daily living that were focused in the apartment location. The protocol was then deployed at the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System to survey healthcare providers who treat veterans with TBI. Our collaboration allowed us to further expand our work to incorporate a virtual space into our rehabilitation environment. This innovation is an immersive experience that allows learning in an environment closer to everyday real life scenarios and can be done remotely at home. The study investigated the usability of VRR to obtain feedback on usability, task demand, and recommended adjustments. The preliminary analysis shows that providers found the VRR protocol involved low physical demand and would likely recommend it to their patients. Although there were concerns regarding vertigo-like symptoms from using a digital technology, the healthcare Providers believe the protocol would improve IADL functioning and was a good addition to the pre-existing rehabilitation protocols. The next phase of the project will include feedback from our patients and other stakeholders, such as the health and industry leaders. When we are developed, our goal is to find ways to make it more interesting for patients so they will have better adherence to their therapies and live a better life. Results of this study highlight the potential clinical use of a VRR protocol for veterans recovering from a TBI and provide justification for more impactful studies investigating its effectiveness. So that could, particular study was uh, being done in um, with the military and unfortunately most advanced or a lot of advancements in rehabilitation happen because of um, warfare and um, um, the results of uh, uh, military involvement because um, there's a lot of money there uh, for one thing so I, I visited Walter Reed a few years ago and um, they have an amazing uh, virtual reality uh, program that works on on balance um, and that type of thing with recovery and brain injury patients. Um, second area I wanted to talk about was robotics. Um, it's another area that some of us know a little bit about. We've seen robots. Um, and these, the use of robotics can mean everything from robots that we think of, um, we think of the Jetsons and things like that, to um, robotic uh, limbs or suits that people put on. Um, and the great thing about this is it allows um, customization to the patient's needs. You can tailor um, the technology to what the in needs are of the individual. It can provide a precise repetitive movements for more accurate and targeted rehabilitation. Um, there's improved patient engagement and motivation um, basically because it's, it's, it's fun and the patient gets automatic feedback. Uh, they can see progress right away. And I think we'll see that in the video we're going to watch here. Um, they can, uh, and also they can, the re 
the risk of injury to the patient and therapist can be reduced through the use of, of some of these robotic um, um, garments. So the next slide again will be a, um, a video. So, yeah, the video or the audio on that, I apologize, was not good. These are all links to YouTube videos, but for some reason, some are playing better than others. Um, but basically, that is um, what's called an, uh, an exoskeleton um, robotic device. And uh, that can be controlled by the treating therapist to um, to basically help with the gait cycle. And that's what you saw there. But it's got many, many robotics in general have many potential uses. And, um, and some of these um, forms of technology also has some overlap. So I've seen um, robotics being used together with uh, virtual reality. And you can just let your imagination go wild in terms of what all the potential uses of, of this will be. The next one I think is is really if if if, uh, if you haven't been amazed yet, I think this will will amaze you. What are called brain computer interfaces, and a lot of people have heard of robotics, they've heard of virtual reality, but uh, BCIs are something that a lot of people are not familiar with, and these are devices that allow direct communication between the brain and an external device. Um, they can be used uh, for um, motor rehab, in other words, to control external devices such as robotic limbs. Uh, they can be used for cognitive therapy to improve attention and, and memory as well as other um, cognitive uh, purposes. They can be used for neurofeedback to provide patient uh, feedback regarding their own brain activity. And as, uh, as well, they can provide um, uh, communication rehab in terms of helping patients who have lost the ability to speak or write and be, can be used to type messages or control a speech synthesizer. Um, so hopefully this, this video, the sound will work a little better. Yeah, we can't hear the sound on this one at all. There's no sound. There wasn't. Is it is the sound now? I just now yeah, now we can hear it, I think. Imagine moving a mechanical arm by just thinking about it. 
or playing a video game using only your mind. Although it may seem like science fiction, scientists and engineers have been developing this technology for decades. It's called Brain Computer Interface, or BCI. The field of brain computer interfaces relies on the ability of uh, the brain to be able to generate certain types of responses that can then be harnessed by computers to be able to be interpreted by computers. Dr. Rajesh Rao is a neuroengineer and director of the Center for Sensory Motor Neuroengineering at the University of Washington <laughs> and is funded by the National Science Foundation. He is developing safe, non-evasive devices that can connect to the brain to accomplish things like controlling a prosthetic arm or sending commands to a computer. Looking at the development of this whole field of brain computer interfaces, to think of it in terms of studying how the brain controls the body. Whether it's telling the legs to jump in the air or activating glands to produce sweat, the body's actions and functions are controlled by neurons. They communicate information to and from the brain and the rest of the nervous system using chemical and electrical signals. And so they're sending these electrical pulses to each other and eventually to the muscles that are then controlling my body. Much like how the brain controls muscles, researchers can use new technologies to tap into these signals to control machines. The understanding of how the brain controls movement led to the development of devices and algorithms that can be implemented on a computer that you know, recognize these patterns in the activity of brain cells and then correspondingly move an artificial device. To demonstrate how this technology works, Rao and his team of students use a BCI that allows them to study nonverbal communication. First, the student is fitted with an electroencephalogram, or EEG cap, which is a series of electrodes placed on the scalp to record brain signals. When a question appears on the monitor, the student answers yes or no by looking at one of the flashing lights which are blinking at different frequencies. When the subject's eyes focus on one of the response lights, the frequency of that specific light is picked up by the visual cortex in the brain and measured by the EEG cap. 12 hertz represents a yes frequency, while a no is at a frequency of 13 hertz. Now you can see a picture of right 12 hertz. No is for 12. The computer interprets the signal and moves the cursor in the direction of the response. Using an EEG cap isn't the only way to measure brain activity. Some BCIs use a method called electrocorticography. It also records brain activity, but unlike the EEG cap, it is surgically placed directly on the surface of the brain, providing a clearer signal and more precise information. For example, they can imagine moving their hands, and we use the computer to extract the patterns that correspond to imagined uh, movement of the hand compared to, for example, not imagining and just resting. From there, the computer can distinguish the two types of brain activity. Imagining movement and not imagining movement. Then, use that information to enable hand control by mental activity. Given the right kinds of information and the right kinds of devices that are useful for the animal or for the human, the brain can start to adapt. With practice, the brain can learn to do something it's never done before like control of prosthetic it's not familiar with. But the key is to understand how these neural networks communicate between the brain and the body. So if you're able to understand the brain better, then you're also able to build better brain computer interfaces because then they can use those signals that are responsible for different kinds of things. As Rao continues to collaborate with engineers, neuroscientists, and neurosurgeons to develop more BCI devices, he is working toward a future where the brain and technology come together seamlessly. And then the, uh, the last area of technology I want to talk about is something that we are, that we use presently in the rehab setting on a regular basis, and that is um, electrical stimulation or function, functional electrical stimulation. And uh, basically, this technology in general uses an electrical stimulation to stimulate or activate muscles that are weakened or paralyzed. And it not only can improve muscle function, but it can reduce muscle atrophy. 
Uh, it, we, we use it in gait training uh, to help restore functional gait pattern and reduce risk of fall. We can use it in upper limb function to uh, improve strength, obviously, reduce atrophy and improve the uh, function of the limb itself. And then uh, we have been using it in um, swallow function for several years now. There's a, um, a um, device called a vital stem that actually attaches to inactive muscles that are used in swallowing to help restore swallow function again. Uh, so this next video will show you an example of, of that. FES stands for Functional Electrical Stimulation. FES can help functionally with uh, strengthening muscles that are weak, so the clinician will help select which muscle, depending on the goal that the client has, and the treatment entails low energy electrical current that's applied to, to help the muscle contract. Isolation, just to help with strengthening a muscle, it will help also reduce atrophy. Yeah, We could probably skip to the end of this video because that sounds like the audio is not working well. Um, but basically, what we're, what we're watching there is a young lady who has had a spinal cord injury. Um, the technology and the idea are the same, however, for a brain injury um, patient. And she is using an FES bike um, because of weak limbs. Um, the, the system is stimulating weakened muscles to contract um, when they're unable to. And as she gains recovery, you can back off on some of the stimulation, not stimulate some of the muscles that are now working or stimulate them less. And they can be stimulated at a very, a very specific time um, in the gait cycle or, or when riding a bicycle or whether it's using the hand or whatever um, to stimulate um, a particular motion. So it's not being constantly, the muscle's not constantly being stimulated. It's being stimulated in a fashion to reproduce uh, a particular movement or action. And the, um, the last area that I wanted to talk about of advancement, again, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, we, if the pandemic uh, was good for one thing, it was good for, um, I think improving physician and the medical community's comfort level with telemedicine. Um, probably all of you or most of you by now have had uh, a visit with a doctor via telemedicine, um, especially during the pandemic. And, um, and that's, that's been a great advancement. Um, even um, where I am right now, I'm, I'm in Milford and we, we have an abundance of specialists um, at our um, beck and call here, it's, it's wonderful. Um, but there are some um, specialists who, who aren't available um, locally. So we can call a, 
a neuropsychologist and have them do a telemedicine visit with the patient at the bedside. Um, they may be on a tablet or a, a laptop or something like that. Um, or we can call a, um, we can have a neurosurgeon in, in Dover consult on a, uh, a patient here in Milford. Um, but so you can imagine if it's beneficial here in Milford, it's especially beneficial in places that are even more remote, like um, Alaska or even part uh, third world countries where uh, people are, are tremendously underserved. Um, it, it is a convenient option for patients, especially those who have difficulty traveling. So you know, many folks with either spinal cord injuries or brain injuries have trouble um, getting out of the house at times. Um, so if there's um, transportation issues, you know, that can be helpful. Um, it also helps patients uh, increase engagement in their own care. It can improve outcomes and lead to better adherence to uh, therapy regimens. And I think that that comes by uh, a more frequency uh, or more frequent visits um, and that there's some accountability. Um, it also can obviously be more cost effective if you're not having to travel three hours to see a specialist. Um, and it can facilitate collaboration between healthcare providers and improving coordination of care. So um, from a very uh, selfish standpoint, I have, um, I have seen um, telemedicine make tremendous difference in um, uh, medical mission work uh, that I have been involved with. Uh, the next slide will show you a uh, crowd of people um, that I saw one time in, in Burkina Faso, which is in West Africa. And these are people, we went to a village here that was very remote. Uh, and most of these people had never, ever seen a, a physician. Um, just an interesting uh, statistic. In the US, there is one doctor for every 300 people. And in, uh, I actually wrote it down here, in, in Uganda, according to the World Health Organization, in Uganda, there's one doctor for every 25,000 people. Um, so you can imagine what telemedicine may do uh, to help some of these folks. Um, the next slide is, uh, is me attending to some of, to one of these uh, patients. And then the next slide would give you some idea of, um, you know, there are some healthcare providers, um, such as a nurse practitioner that I met in uh, Burkina, uh, down in the bottom right-hand corner. And um, she's there on the ground. She's there. Um, she lives there. She um, holds these medical clinics on a regular basis. And the great thing is that everybody has cell phones now. You, you can be in the most remote part of the world and people will still have cell phones. Uh, and if they have a cell phone, um, they can have access to um, other providers uh, all over the world with specialties that they may not have in their own uh, country or region. So, well, I want to thank you all. Sorry again, ironically, for the technical difficulties that we had. Um, I believe that we'll be able to provide links to those actual videos, though, so you can watch them on your own and um, hopefully without distraction and get a little more out of them. Um, so, with that said, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Dr. Anderson, I'd just like to let everyone know that the chat function has been disabled. I apologize for that. I spoke in error. If you would write your questions in the Q&A section, then we'll be able to share them with Dr. Anderson. And I will be sharing the links um, to the videos and a copy of the presentation um, with everyone who have who has attended. I will also post it on BIAS website and we will post it on um, our YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. I'll post it on there as well. Great. I don't see any question. Well, let me see here. So okay, there we, is a question. Yeah, we, you, you there is it. one question from D. I see it says, have you found that the pharmacological medicines are different from the mental health medicines? And um, I would say that, um, you know, some of those medicines that I mentioned that we're presently using are certainly mental, mental health medicines per se. They are, they are used 
in other settings for depression or anxiety. Um, but what we find with the um, traumatic brain injury patients, as well as other patients, uh, such as the elderly population that may be more prone to or more sensitive to some of the medications that um, some medications are better than others, I guess is what I'm trying to say with the use of, of TBI patients. So, you know, we have to be careful, but there's a lot of overlap there that some of the some of the medicines that I mentioned that we use are certainly used in the general population to treat both anxiety and um, depression, both of which are, are prevalent in the TBI population as well. That's a good question though. Any other questions? We have one more. Uh, brain injury survivors have issues getting longer access to rehabilitation from their health care insurance. Do you know of a way that we could advocate to overcome that? That's another great, great question. Um, and I touched on that a little bit. I think some of this research that's coming out, um, the insurance companies are going to have a hard time trying to figure out how to handle that information because what they're what they're basically saying as research um, goes on for, for not just TBI, but other types of neurologic injury is that the window of recovery is much larger than we thought it was at one time. And so um, to, to arbitrarily cut a patient off from further rehab after a certain date um, may be challengeable um, through some of this research. So I would say to advocate, you know, stay up on the on the research. Um, uh, you know, encourage the physicians that are involved in those areas of research to become politically active and, and not just to promote their uh, the results of their research in the academic world, but also to um, to let the, um, the the people who make the determination and the insurance companies to make them aware of uh, the, these findings and the fact that um, patients can continue to benefit from rehabilitation and different forms of rehabilitation for many months, if not years, after their original injury. All right, well, thank you all for attending and uh, Again, if anybody has any questions that trickle in later, I'd be happy to answer them after the fact. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson, and thank you everyone who has attended. I would like to invite everyone. Um, this is a monthly webinar series that we host and we have different speakers every month. So I would like for everyone to please um, clear your schedules out and attend the next session that we are going to have. Um, every session is um, on Tuesdays and it starts at 2.30 and it's from 2.30 to 3.30. And we just like everyone to please attend. I will be sending out um, the series for the entire, the rest of the year, 2023. So anyone share it with your networks, your social media, your constituents and your friends, please. Thank you. Cheryl, did you have anything you'd like to say? Oh, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Anderson. That was very informative. Um, Zawai and I have been exchanging emails throughout your conversation or throughout your presentation. And what we'd like to do is actually give you a platform to really, we want to share this directly with our survivors and caregivers. So we'll have our um, support group facilitators actually probably play your whole presentation at one of their support groups, because I think it's so important that survivors and caregivers really plug into the, the treatment aspect of, of brain injury. I think that they just need to understand it. And you were so easy to listen to, and you were very informative, and I think they will appreciate being a part of, of this conversation. And I know, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I know this was a, a kind of a broad overview on a lot of different topics. And I just kind of wanted to um, improve people's awareness of some of these areas uh, of research um, and some things that we're actually doing in the real world. And then also, um, you know, I'd be more than happy to dig a little deeper or do a deeper dive into some of these areas 
you know, uh, in other in future talks, if you're interested in that. Well, I was especially fascinated with all of the new technology around brain injury. That was just, I think that will give people that little spark of hope and will excite survivors and caregivers. I, I thought that was amazing. So thank you. And the exciting thing about that too, is that the University of Delaware in particular is doing some pretty exciting work when it comes to technology and, and rehabilitation. So right up the road. So hopefully we can get them involved in seeing some of our patients locally here. Um, awesome. So Dee just did share something. Um, she wants to make sure we um, provide the brain injury survivors um, information on the SCPD TBI toolkit. Um, she's put the the link here. I will. I have it already, but I will copy and paste it again. Um, Dee, if you want to, I'm going to unmute you. If you would like to just add to that, please do. Uh, it's something that the Brain Injury Committee, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. the Brain Injury Committee of Delaware recently worked very hard to get this on our website. And it's a resource for brain injury survivors, their families and caregivers. It explains about it. It tells the difference between concussions, the ABI and the TBI, but it offers a lot of resources for the families that if they're looking for something, we tell them where to get it, including the state of Delaware's traumatic brain injury fund that covers things that their insurance companies don't and they can put in an application for us. So I just want to make sure you're aware of that for telling families. Yes, yeah, so Dr. Anderson, I put that in the chats directly to you. Um, nice. Zawaya will also share that when we share this, um, this replay with folks, we'll share that link as well. Um, and we will be sharing it broadly, Biad in general, we'll be sharing it broadly with, with everybody we come in contact with. But it's a great resource. Thanks, Dee. You're Thank welcome. You. Awesome. So why anything else you want to add? Any other housekeeping? We go no housekeeping. I will just be sending this information out as I stated. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Anderson. It was a great, great, great presentation. I've learned so much. Um, so I want to thank you and thank you for everyone for participating and taking time out of your schedule and joining. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.